Let me just introduce myself again. I'm Melvin Otieno from Kenya. I'm the founder of Planetary Health Eastern Africa Hub. I welcome you all to today's lecture. And in brief, um, Planetary Health Eastern African Hub offers an opportunity to learn and share about planetary health and also for, to learn more about the emergency in the Eastern African region. We aim to stimulate regional community building, provide education for transformative action and push for strategic policy making in the face of the greatest planetary health emergency of our time. Um, on 5th of November, uh, we had our first lecture series uh, on the introduction of planetary health for Eastern Africa. And we are privileged to have uh, the first introduction done by me and the director of the Planetary Health Alliance, Dr. Sam Meas. And it's exciting to finally have our second lecture on the Eastern African challenges and opportunities to the way to planetary health. So we will have uh, three speakers today with us. And the first speaker will be Professor Sano Odipo. And um, he's actually a lecturer at the University of Eldoret and a veterinarian and has been involved in various academic and research leadership activities. And uh, he has been also in participating in regional assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services for Africa for IPBES as a lead author. So I would like to leave uh, the, the session for him to start off uh, with the first lecture. Good afternoon. Uh, I will be talking about Eastern Africa challenges and opportunities to planetary health. Uh, briefly, I think my background should, uh, uh, should present uh, why I'm interested so much in planetary health. After doing maths, biology, and chemistry at high school, I got interested in veterinary medicine, where I, I qualified to carry out clinical practices, uh, surgeries, and uh, experience a lot of interactions with farmers. I then uh, did a master's in veterinary public health, where I focused so much on food hygiene, epidemiology uh, of zoonosis, and disease outbreak controls. And uh, well, uh, in further pursuit of uh, academic, of my academics, I, I did a PhD in environmental toxicology where I focused a lot on the transformation of toxicants, especially in the tropics, and got very interested in an animal or species, a Xenopus, and used it a lot to try to understand the uh, uh, effects of toxicants, environmental toxicants. And currently, uh, we are involved a lot in uh, researching on hidden effects of contaminants, both the metals and uh, organic compounds. And I found a home uh, of my interest in planetary health, and therefore really got so deeply interested in planetary health because it aligns with my, my historical interests. Uh, I am currently carrying out research on dynamics of occurrence and, and effects of environmental contaminants in the tropics. I'm trying to understand the relationship between land use and land degradation and transfer of nutritious, nutritious elements in diets. Uh, that's a brief history of myself. Uh, what is planetary health? Planetary health is the health of human civilization and the state of natural systems on which it depends. After my first contact with Planetary Health Alliance and the community of planetary health in 2017, uh, a, a lot of things have evolved and we did agree to form hubs in, globally. And we have so far formed the Saharan African uh, hub, which comprises the countries that are shown in dark green. Uh, though there are small controversies about whether Somalia belongs there. Nevertheless, uh, this part of the world has 1.1 billion people. And it has a number of countries. The area covers 17% of the world. And however, the GDP is five times le five time less than the global average. To implement our vision, we, we have built uh, the Eastern African region planetary health 
sub hub of the of the sub saharan hub and 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 this makes it easier for us to to start off otherwise uh, the sub saharan african would have been so large a piece to achieve so we have uh, we we are glad to say that we with support of uh, collaborators we are able to start up activities uh, challenges and opportunities in this region we can tease them out when we do a walk through the sustainable development goals and planetary health approach underlines the needs to address combined health and environmental issues these are the well known sustainable development goals and the major concerns in eastern africa so one of the major challenges in this block in this in this region is the youth and unemployment africa is young the region is endowed with a young population as you can see from uh, when you compare that when you compare the african uh, population pyramid with europe and uh, and the us africa is this beautiful young uh, population that is quite an opportunity for us however unemployment is still nagging so we have an opportunity uh, as a group to carry out more training and align our curriculum to the needs of the youth to collaborate with partners to improve the policy on youth make it easy for youth to engage in activities that are income generating and poverty alleviating improve infrastructure that address to youth so planetary eastern african hub have carried out a few actions we have formed clubs in learning institutions we have enhanced networking through webinar meetings we have gotten youth to work with the surrounding community and uh, some of us are involved in curricular development at various levels with the planetary health alliance group another issue is biodiversity biodiversity could benefit individuals communities societies nations and humanity it has a big potential to confer good quality of life and this may be through a supply of food meat and uh, biodiversity is very important for pollination biodiversity is important for water conservation as sources of pharmaceuticals as industrial raw materials say furniture paper hides and so forth biodiversity is important for land management e.g. flood control and watershed protection biodiversity is also very important for non consumptive uses recreation tourism and aesthetics for example or uh, for informational value or very importantly in in view of climate change climate sequest for carbon sequestration opportunities in this region can be found in uh, some of these activities if we can improve on payment for biodiversity improvement of uh, uh, intellectual property rights uh, management improvement of infrastructure for project development of biodiversity based enterprises for example uh, some very nice projects are happening at the kenyan coast where some youth are engaged in collection of butterflies that have some value to some other people in other parts of the world and education uh, as for us the so far we have involved the local youth in biodiversity conservation by the student clubs and there are more to come another issue of health is waterborne diseases i think uh, the governments in this region have talked so much about uh, tapped water that is piped water to households but that is meeting with a lot of challenges so there are some opportunities on point of presence water treatment uh, water conservation and waste management as a hub we could enhance education research we could actually promote uh, appropriate technologies and carry out advocacy it, for example uh, this uh, the this technology on the top right biosan filter is quite cheap it may be used to alleviate the problem that you are seeing on the slide in the background An another issue of health is nutrition there are opportunities of fortification of food 
application of biotechnology to improve uh, quantities of food, uh, improvement of productivity through breeding and a number of things, eh? and maybe veterinary services and uh, agricultural services. There are opportunities also on culture change. Yeah, a, a few people have been convinced and uh, uh, made to believe that uh, crickets can be food or maybe the white ants. Uh, as a planetary health uh, East African hub, we hope to enhance education and also to highlight benchmarks that we can use in our region. Uh, actually, the nutrition issues can, is best captured in this uh, broader notion of nutrition and food security by IFPRI, where we talk about uh, other nutrition, hunger, overnutrition, and, uh, and, and so on. Another issue of health is zoonotic and uh, neglected tropical diseases. Uh, we have a great opportunity in control of human wildlife con contacts, enhancement of immunization programs, and carrying out research. Actually, we lack research. And even then, some of our researches are not well published. When we publish our research, we make it possible for others to contribute on our, uh, I mean, to add on to our findings. So as a planetary health uh, hub, we are going to continue with educating the public on zoonosis and not neglected tropical diseases and uh, carry out advocacy. And uh, I'm just giving an example of uh, the extent to which the different uh, zoonotic diseases are studied and, uh, and, and published. The current pandemic is, is caused by a zoonosis is a zoonosis caused by bat, which are otherwise very important components of our biodiversity in Sub-Saharan Africa. Pollutions, we still don't have adequate planning for management of our waste in our urbans. And our energy sources still leave a lot of questions. So we intend to educate people on the benefits of proper planning for management of waste and on waste management, and also provide benchmarks, and also educate people also on different energy sources. For example, this is uh, something you see in, in, uh, in, in the suburbs of several African cities. This can be any city in any of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And, and it's, it's still a serious problem that we need to, to solve. Another issue is a lifestyle. Uh, diseases. This is also setting in in Africa. I know many people don't believe that, but the truth is that uh, we are also getting the same problems that other developed worlds get, that you know, obesity and the rest. So we have opportunities to encourage exercise, to put up infrastructure for non-motorized vehicles, for example, and to encourage sports. So as planetary health, Eastern Africa have Actually, we've taken part in this encourage, encouragement of sports and uh, physical activities, education and advocacy. Yeah, a bicycle would make a very good uh, means of transport in a number of communities, in a number of neighborhoods in our, among our communities. Another issue is mental health. We have opportunities for organizing psychiatric support and also improving on diagnosis. Sometimes this is normally comes very lately when matters are difficult to reverse. So as planetary health um, hub, we would like to be able to learn very simple diagnostic methods for diagnosing problems that may lead to serious psychiatric problems and also encourage exercises. As you can see, uh, mental health is a growing problem in the sub-Saharan Africa. And the projection is that it will get much worse in the next 30 years. Another issue, and a very important issue, is climate change. This doesn't leave uh, Eastern African region out. And climate change already is impacting on us. It's leading to disease occurrences in new, in new areas and uh, causing threats of flooding on islands. 
recently, a number of people were moved out of their uh, homes along Lake Victoria because of increased flooding. There's a lot of flooding on a lake in Kenya, Lake Baringo, and a number of people will have to be shifted out of their homes. Losses of biodiversity and frequent occurrences of drought are all problems that come as a result of climate change. There are key opportunities and actions that we can carry out. We can encourage changes uh, in, use, in, in the energy sources from fossil fuel, and we have a lot of opportunity in this, from fossil fuel to renewable energy. We should urgently tackle the issue of mass transport in our cities. We should put action on, put down action on carbon sequestration through afforestation programs and so forth. We should plan our urban centers better, increase and do a lot of advocacy. These are all possible in Africa. Actually, that wind farm on the top right is, is in one of the parts of uh, Kenya, north, northern part of Kenya, to, around Lake Tobukana. And uh, Kenya is also, is also blessed with the geothermal from Adani. And we have a number of water resources that can still be harnessed and used for hydroelectric power production. What about solar panels? They have become so cheap yet they generate energy without harming the environment in any way. Environmental, another problem that we have in our region is land degradation. And this causes threats of soil, loss of soil fertility through depletion, leaching, or acidity. Flooding, losses of nutrients in dirts and erosion are all problems that can arise due to land degradation. We could encourage and we should encourage responsible agricultural practices, exploit other sources of income so that we can leave some land, pieces of land to rest. We should enhance income from the areas that we are already exploiting through value addition. And we should put more concerted efforts on soil conservation. This is an example of an area that is very poorly managed. And this could have been because of a movement of maybe grazing animals in an area that was only occupied by browsers and so forth. So another thing is water resource protection. Our lakes are getting eutrophic and we are getting losses of biodiversity, sometimes through over exploitation, over fishing and the rest. We have pollution with toxic elements and compounds from the catchments. So we have key opportunities and, uh, and action that we can carry out, uh, key opportunities that we can exploit and actions that we can carry out to protect our water bodies. Uh, improvement of catchment management, responsible agricultural practices, and policing fisheries. Actually, policing fisheries has been known to improve on on, on numbers, population of fish in, in, in some parts of Lake Victoria, Uganda and Tanzania, for example. This is on Lake Victoria. Actually, this is the lake. And uh, you, as you can see at the bottom uh, right, uh, a boat had to penetrate through this. And this is quite a, a nuisance on the lake. And this is all because of poor catchment management or, this, or uh, yeah, some parts of the lake, the lake is actually just green. That's Lake Victoria. Another thing, another problem we have is uh, weaknesses in policy. There are gaps and weaknesses in policy. We need to put in our efforts in formulation and implementation and advocacy of right policies. You could act, actively participate in formulation and we could apply our networks to benchmark and continuously critique the existing policies. In conclusion, I think the region requires a lot of urgency from our action. We need to espouse continuous learning, leverage on global network that we already have of, planetary, of the planetary health community, develop tools, for example, curricula to facilitate planetary health actions, we have opportunities to participate in ensuring change. Let's do it.
Thank you so much, Professor Odipo Sano, for the great presentation. I would like to welcome our second presenter, that is Mrs. Munyinda from Zambia. She's actually the lecturer and a, a researcher responsible for environmental pollution and toxicology unit in the Department of Environmental Health of Public Health at the University of Zambia. She has a background in environmental science and management with specific expertise in natural resource management. I kindly welcome you, Mrs. Nosiku Munyinda. And um, after this, uh, Laura will take over uh, from here. That, she's from Germany. She's our team member. And I welcome you, Mrs. Munyinda, again. Good afternoon, everyone. I believe we're still in the afternoon, even in, even in Europe. As has been said, my name is Nosiku Munyinda from the University of Zambia. And um, also presenting on Eastern Africa challenges on climate, on planetary health. And to start, I'm starting with a um, quotation from a Minister of Lands and Natural Resources. So how does Zambia fare in light of global disease burden? I think I'll focus more on the health issues. You see from the first map there, the first map is looking at um, Zambia in terms of its climate. Zambia has been classified as a temperate, um, humid country. Um, I don't know, Melvin, if you can point. Zambia is right in the middle of Eastern and Southern Africa, and they're surrounded by eight countries, so totally landlocked, just like a lot of other African countries. So we depend a lot on what's happening in our neighboring, our neighboring countries. So any variability in climate definitely affects um, the country, both economically as well as physiologically. The second picture that you have there looks at the global burden of disease, the one in the middle. You will see there that Zambia, just like most of Sub-Saharan Africa, has a very high burden of different types of diseases. And our third picture is looking at the malaria map. And again, just like um, was said in the previous presentation, most of malaria in the world comes from Sub-Saharan Africa, almost 80% of morbidity and mortality from malaria is coming from um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have a number of policies um, that are trying to address these issues. And again, we have to ask ourselves, are these policies enough? So for this particular lecture focus, I am going to focus a lot on human activities and health. And I've picked three, three specific case studies. The first one is looking at mining. Um, Zambia and the other African countries are mining countries. I think we're still second largest producer of copper after Chile. So we have a lot of mining and resulting pollution. And then we also have an energy crisis. Again, this is very similar to what's happening in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa. There's an energy crisis leading to massive load shedding and so on. So we'll look at a case study on energy. And lastly, we'll look at um, malaria. So yes, Zambia made it to the top 10. What does this mean? It's not top 10 in football, it's not top 10 in motor racing. Kabwe, the town where lead mining has been done in the last 100 years, has been classified as one of the 10 most polluted cities in the world. This pollution has been found in soil, it's been found in water, and it's been found in blood. So we have made it to the top 10, unfortunately, of having one of the most polluted cities in the world. So lead, as we know, is a heavy metal, which is absorbed through inhalation, through absorption, through ingestion, and sometimes through the skin. And perhaps to note is that children absorb 30% to 50% more amounts of lead than adults. So children are much, much more vulnerable to lead exposure than adults. And this increases during pregnancy. The absorption increases during pregnancy. So we conducted a study. Um, studies have been done in Kabwe. And you'll notice that um, we were comparing blood lead levels between mothers and children. So if you know about lead, you know that this, the WHO limit for lead in blood should be between five to 10 micrograms per deciliter. If you look at these graphs that we have there, we have a child in Kabwe that has above 381 micrograms per deciliter. So that's almost 38 times what the CDC have put as a limit for lead. 
this leads to the question, what are the resulting health effects on these children? So we went further and looked at neurodevelopment outcomes. Our colleagues are looking at IQ, but in this presentation, I'll just look at neurodevelopment outcomes. So in terms of neurodevelopment outcomes, we did find that um, the children in Kabwe, um, almost a quarter of them were below the cutoff points for the normative values for communication, for fine motor skills, for problem solving. Again, we, we've read in literature from around the world, especially in developed countries, that lead does affect how the brain develops. So we wanted to see if the situation was still very similar with what, we, with what was happening around the world. And indeed, we did find that the children had lower scores compared to the other normative values around the world. And there were significant differences in the areas. The areas that are closer to the mines had the highest amounts of lead and the children there were also um, scored lower in terms of almost all the neurodevelopment domains. So we, we also talked to the caregivers to find out what other concerns did they have. And you notice that most of the caregivers talked about the children having hearing complications, the children had loss of weight, the children had delayed speech, the children showed aggression, um, the children were not working on time, the children had speech problems again, some of them were too quiet, so they had some social interactive problems, and so on. So you can see that this sort of ties in with what we found when we did the neurodevelopment assessment, that there seems to be a problem with communication. The children are not able to express themselves very well, and, and they are also, also not able, able to walk on time. time. So, so because, because lead replaces calcium, calcium in the bones, so maybe that so could affect, affect, affect um, how, how their, their, their motor, motor skills, skills develop. So this was confirmed. The next issue that we'll deal with is to look at energy crisis, especially household energy. And to cope with this, households are using various sources of energy. In the pictures that you're seeing there are people that are using firewood, um, to cook with, and we can see the resulting smoke from this firewood. So we, we, we conducted a study in it, um, the two energy uses. You see on the right-hand side that you have the tradition of firewood, and we had an intervention from a Swedish company that brought in these stoves that use wooden pellets. So we're trying to compare the energy efficiency, air pollutants, and so on between these two, between these two technologies. So we went to the material 570 households, we interviewed them and we found not very surprising that 95%, almost 95% of them use charcoal as their primary energy source and the rest share um, among firewood, gas and some of them use the alternative energy. It was a bit surprising to find that some households actually still use crop residues um, as household energy, and that just shows you how desperate the situation can get, that whatever um, can give people energy, they will use it. The reasons for these choices were given as it's cheaper, and then you can save on power, and also it's easily accessible. Almost all of them gave us these two reasons. Then we looked at the location of the cooking sites. More than, more than almost 45, about 45% of the households were cooking indoors. And if you remember those pictures that I shared earlier on that had the smoke, you can imagine what's happening to those people that are cooking inside those houses and we'll see um, the implications on health for that. We also measured air pollutant levels. You see here that we measured carbon, we measured carbon monoxide, we measured volatile organic compounds, we measured formaldehyde and uh, um, particulate matter. And interesting to note is when you compare the charcoal users with the wooden pellets to the WHO limits, you'll find that not surprisingly, carbon monoxide is three times higher than the WHO limit for charcoal users, as is formaldehyde and volatile organic compounds. But the particulate matter levels were higher in the wooden pellet households. So this was, again, a bit surprising because you'd expect that it's cleaner energy. Why would we have high particulate matter levels in those households using the cleaner, in brackets, the cleaner energy? So we compared these results with um, air quality index to see what health effects they would have. And you can see here that almost all of them are above the orange zone. So they're, they're unhealthy. Um, values for sensitive populations, as well as very, very unhealthy. 
for carbon monoxide, we had concentrations that were almost 2000 ppm. Again, we tried to look at what could be the health effects and these were the reported health effects from the households that ranged from respiratory effects and fatigue. Some households reported unconsciousness, dizziness, throat dryness and so on. And again, we know that carbon monoxide does cause some of this um, carbon monoxide poisoning does cause some of these effects. So some of these households have actually um, experienced carbon monoxide poisoning. So we went further and did some statistical analysis and found that um, the households that were using wooden pellets had higher percentages of reported respiratory conditions. Again, very surprising, but after a more uh, stratification after more controlling for the energy source and a few other variables, we found that the, the cooking indoors with closed windows was significantly associated with the prevalence of respiratory conditions. So because this is considered as cleaner energy, most of the households are cooking indoors. And unfortunately, the design of the houses is not uh, very suitable for that kind of cooking. There's very poor ventilation. The walls and the floors are not plastered. So that um, could have led to the reported respiratory conditions that were higher in those, in those households. And lastly, I'll look at the malaria dilemma. We know that malaria is still a leading cause of death and hospital admissions in Zambia and mostly affected are pregnant women and children. So to, to address this, we have in, an integrated vector management strategy, which includes indoor residual spraying with DDT as one of the chemicals of choice. So again, some people get surprised that we're still talking about DDT in the year 2020. DDT is a persistent organic pollutant, which was banned in the developed world as early as the 1970s. And in the year 2000, it was listed under the Stockholm Convention for Elimination. But some African countries um, lobbied for its continued use in the malaria control program. And Zambia was one of these countries. So since 2000, we've had more than 250,000 kilograms of DDT brought into the country and um, audits by our environmental agency show that there's some possible breakdowns in the storage and in how the DDT is being used. And given what we know from literature about the harm that DDT does to the environment and to human health, in, in, in circumstances like ours where you also have very poor socioeconomic conditions, we wanted to look at what was happening in Zambia. So a study was done to this effect. And um, we did find very high levels of DDT in soils and water of selected communities. We were getting soils from around the houses where the DDT was being sprayed and water from various drinking water bodies. And you notice that the water levels are much higher than the levels that are in soil which again was a bit surprising, but later on we did find out that sometimes if there are left stocks of the DDT, the spray operators um, would dispose of them in pit latrines or they'll just throw them near taps. So maybe this could explain why we had very high levels in, in water. And of course the levels in the soil were also very high. WHO limit for DDT, the, the health risk limit is one microgram per kg of body weight. So you can see that these both for soils and water exceed the WHO limit. As we can see, these vegetables are consumed both locally and they're also sold at open markets. The um, studies in other parts of Africa have shown that if you have DDT in the soil, if you have DDT in water, chances that you find it in vegetables, in, in animals like chickens and fish are also very, very high. So exposure is definitely there. Also found that um, all the homes where the DDT was being used um, had water bodies as we've seen around them. And um, they were also being used in low cost housing areas. And on average 45% of the homes where chemicals were used had both pregnant women and children. So that talks about the transplacental transfer of, of the chemicals from the mother to the unborn baby as well. And again, in the houses where the DDT was being used, we can see the type of houses we're talking about. These are usually um, mud, mud houses with grass roofs or thatched houses where vectors find it very easy to breed. You find a lot of mosquitoes in those houses and other types of vectors are also present. No running water. Um, the water sources are usually wells, open wells or 
streams or rivers. So this is just a series of pictures looking at the local environmental conditions in a lot of um, peri-urban areas where children are spending between 12 to 16 hours outside. Shared water, shared water points, a lot of people use communal water points that they're sharing. They don't have piped uh, water in a lot of these areas. And then we come to the point of, and then so what? This is, these are things that we, we know by and large, we've heard about this before. Is the story all doom and gloom? Is there hope in the horizon? And my answer is an emphatic yes. We are the ones who have the earth in our hands. We have our planet in our hands. It's our activities that are bringing about all these things that we're talking about. So where do we go from here? How can we all be winners? How can the children be winners? How can the adults be winners? Different parts of the globe. How can the ecosystems benefit? And I believe that our next lecture, lecture three, is going to look at the transformative thinking behind planetary health and the different ways that we can intervene so that we can have a win-win situation for everybody. We have to change how science is done. We have to change the thinking from looking at life as if we're in a lab where everything is controlled. We have same temperature and pressure. Real life is very different. As we saw from the energy, from the energy example that I gave, those wooden pellet stoves have clean, are seen to be clean. They have very low carbon monoxide and so on. But because of the type of houses where they're being used, you find that they are bringing about other respiratory problems because they are not used in the right context or they were not designed for that context. So we have to look at solutions that are in real life and not in a laboratory setting. That entails us going out to find these local solutions. We can't do it sitting in our boardrooms. We can't do it at conferences. We have to go out and actively look for solutions that are community, community driven. We have to go back to the community. We have to talk to community members, find out what works for them, find out what challenges that they're faced with, and with them develop solutions that will work in various settings. Even within Zambia, even within Africa, the situations are different. So we have to go back and consult and get, get solutions that are workable on the ground. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Asante sana, Ziko Mokwambiri, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. And we have a few more questions coming in. Uh, the Planetary Health Alliance offers uh, excellent opportunities for directing funding from the Global North, in, Global North into research projects that are uh, most of most value for Eastern Africa. But um, Professor Udipo, what would you see as being the best way to identify the research that is uh, that most needs to be done and to build the partnerships that can deliver it? In, in my experience, this is a, normally a very difficult question to answer, yet also easy. Uh, the difficulty is that many, many times the, the collaborators have interests and uh, there would be somebody that is interested in water or, or, or fertility or biodiversity. But in in, in general, I, I would say that uh, the best approach would, to, would be to find out what is most urgent in the region uh, in terms of uh, the risks, uh, that is the disabilities, death, and, and then try to align that to the capacities. There, there are times when uh, we have problems that we think are urgent, but we don't have the local capacity and we may need training. So in as much as the project is urgent and you want to collaborate, we, we lack the capacities among, among ourselves. Uh, so I would say that first we, we should categorize them according to the, their effect. And then next take into consideration the capacity because it would be best to do a project that you can uh, reach a solution to, rather than try out to solve something for which uh, a solution may be difficult to achieve. I don't know whether I'm clear on answering that. It's, it's a question that is that, that keeps on cropping because many times the collaborators or the partners from other parts of the world would want to come in 
but there are times when there have been failures and there are times when there have been uh, spectacular successes. So, so what do you say what needed to be done first as a prioritization on the matter of urgency? Yeah, on a matter of effects, the number of people affected, but also on a matter of uh, capacity to carry out that. Yeah, I would say that you, you look into all um, aspects of uh, a problem on whether you have the capacity to solve it. I, I would say that uh, we have capacity to solve a number of things. And the, the, the so sometimes in either other terms called the low hanging, low hanging fruits, like energy changes, that is straightforward. Uh, water purification, the, the technologies that are available are, are very cheap or change of energy to another form is very cheap or, or just immunization. This is also rather easy tackle. In as much as it may not be as urgent as say, reversing uh, malaria, which is very urgent as well, but we still need to build a lot of capacities. There are some areas that are low hanging, which we can just step in and make changes that are very visible. Thank you. Maybe just from your personal perspective, if you could wish for something, what would you prioritize from your experience and from your perspective? Yeah, I would base it on, especially with the planetary health community, I would base it on, from my perspective, I think the student community are very effective at the moment. They take, they take up new things faster than the older people like us. So I would, I would want uh, uh, the advocacy aspect and uh, health and water, yeah, water hygiene would be priority. Thank you um, for your answers and your personal perspective on that. Um, another question that came up is, um, and maybe you have examples on this, is what is locally done to find clean energy solutions? Yeah, the, 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 current, the current thing that is being done is uh, actually just advocacy and, uh, and, and highlighting demonstrations on, on uses of different uh, technologies that are clean, that offer clean energy, like the cooking stoves that have less smoke. Uh, this, if it's not done, many people will, we are normally hard to change before they, you carry out demonstrations. And this can be done quite easily by the community that we are building. That is the, the student community and the other members of the Eastern African Hub that are already joining. They, they can quite easily carry out demonstrations uh, with the technologies. And also we can build capacities to, to manufacture these things. Yeah. And uh, when, when you're saying advocacy, we have another question that, that touches on this and uh, that is on the issue that some of the practices that have a big and uh, adverse effect on health, like uh, could be the use of DDT or air pollution. Uh, they have been used or applied for a very long time in the region. And in your experience, how is the public response to criticism or new proposals that aim to reduce those negative effects, but then potentially also reduce those uh, practices? Uh, what have you experienced with regard to that? Yeah, actually that's a very, uh, that's an area of uh, interest to me so much. Uh, ma ma many people are very concerned about short-term effects, that is the acute effects of toxicants, and they are very much unaware of the uh, long-term effects. DDT is one case in point that has long-term effect. There are a number of other pesticides that have also long-term effects that cause infertility, cancer, and the rest. And the public in my opinion and in my in, in our experience is the public the public is not aware so we need to organize education and i, I mean uh, uh, some uh, we need to organize uh, a communication that is understandable by the public we cannot leave it to the public health authority and others to, to reach out to the public. So if we can come up with small books, booklets that are understandable 
and programs on our local radios that uh, outline the effect, the, especially the long-term effects of BDT. Uh, the long-term effects of uh, atrazine, for example, which has been banned in many parts of the world. There are a number of other pesticides that I know that have been banned in many parts of the world because of their ill effects. The unfortunate thing is that their ill effects are long-term and, and that is hard for the public here to perceive. So the best thing to do is we need to communicate and there's a big gap on that. We need to do that as a planetary health community. We can come up with a, a program that writes uh, books or booklets that are easier to pass on to the general public and with programs that are easier to, to reach out to the public, be it radio or be it television so that the public should be aware of the, the different causes of the, the different uh, effects of different uh, toxicants. My thing, so communication and education as a key. Exa strategy. Exactly, yeah. So one question I think that is very interesting for both of you um, is on the fact that uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, offers levels of acceptable toxicity in our environment. And what do you think uh, of planetary health as a zero tolerance for acceptable levels of toxicity to humans without considering the, the effects for all other lives uh, humans depend on exist? So like the environmental effects, uh, should they be more considered in, in those uh, statements? What do you think maybe? Uh, yeah, Nuziko could start. Okay, that, that's that's a very, very good question. And um, I'm glad you've asked it. While we're doing our studies, what we actually found is exactly that, that we do have limits for health, as in human health, blood limits, we have limits for body burden. But when you look for DDT in soil, for example, DDT safety for animals, we don't have such limits. We don't have you find um, very, very few. And again, maybe WHO is concerned with the human, the human being more than anything else. It would be good if um, FAO, for example, Food and Agriculture Organization and other international organizations could look at the whole ecosystem and not just be so focused on humans because humans do consume that food. So, you know, if, if, if we focus so much on the body burden and not so much on the safety of the water itself, on the soil and so on, it still defeats the purpose. So we have to look at, we have to have a holistic picture. We call it a total homestead approach where you look at the whole picture and look at the earth in its entirety and not so focused on, on the human centric perspective. So definitely there is room to look at other, other parts of, of the planet and not just the people. Thanks, yeah, I think that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and another question as well, and uh, that is if you have identified some of the best energy sources uh, that, that could be the best for the communities in the region so that during mobilization, um, they can showcase and they can establish the, the whole idea. So, but the, the question is a bit of what should we advocate for and what can be the best for the region. Do you have any um, opportunity, uh, any opinions on that or like any ideas where to um, look that up maybe? Um, I think from, from what we've done, the preliminary work we've done is the energy itself is okay. You know, the science behind the energy is, is okay. The different types of alternative energy, they're okay. I think what we lack, um, the systems, you know, we. we Take for example, you have solar energy. Obviously solar energy is as clean as you can get it. But then you have the issue of the solar panels. You have the issue of the batteries that come with the solar energy. And how do you dispose of those batteries? So on one side you have a solution, but on the other side, if you don't take the solution in its entirety, you might be creating another problem of e-waste. Later on, you might be creating another problem of hazardous waste. So after doing our initial study, we're actually in phase two now, where we're looking at all the different types of renewable energy and finding how are they working? What are the challenges um, that people are faced with from the regulatory side, from the user side? 
And from that, we should be able to have a better idea of what would work in our settings, in the different settings. Because even within the local setting, you still have um, houses that are very well ventilated with electricity and so on where it would work. And then you also have the kind of rural setup where you, you have the scenario that we found in material. So it has to be adapted to various settings. And I think we need to do more, more research that is more locally driven. You know, not so much the product type of research, but more on the user side to understand the complexities from the point of use and not so much on the product, on the product safety point. Amazing, thank you very much um, for, for that answer. And I think um, before we are, um, before we are continuing with more questions, we are first of all continuing with our third uh, speaker. That is uh, Dr. Martin Hermann, the director of the German Alliance for Climate Change and Health and the expert for transformative action where they worked with many uh, national and international organizations on, um, on how to make transformative changes towards the better. And we are very happy that he's gonna join us today, uh, giving his perspective on the issue as well. Thank you and welcome. Welcome to everyone. And thank you very much to my colleagues who were speaking before. Um, I'm very impressed to understand more how planetary health uh, kind of issues and challenges are showing up in Eastern Africa. And, um, you know, as uh, we have mentioned last in the, in the introductory lecture uh, two weeks ago, with Paris, it is clear that planetary health on one side is a science, on another side it is a movement. So it is not just to understand the science, it's also to get into action. And uh, since we have a lot of urgency around climate, about biodiversity and all the subjects we were covering today, uh, the question is, how are we getting into action fast? Um, now, I want to highlight a few things I picked up from just the last uh, presentation from Lucico, which I think are very, very important. You were pointing to that science has to change. It has to be much more informed on what is locally happening, how, much more coming from the consumers, from the people who are on the ground, from the communities. And uh, that it's very much more about context sensitivities. And there is another word that you were using. We need a whole ecosystems perspective. And I think we need to be aware, as we see in, in, in the North, in our countries, that the connection of planetary health to human health is not yet included into the curricula. And I assume that something similar is also happening in your countries that the kind of immensity of the different dimensions of planetary health are not yet covered in the curricula. So it is not understood how all these intricacies are working out. And uh, I think we are aware that there is a, a growing movement of, of, uh, of scholars, of students, of policymakers who understand the notion of planetary health. So the question is when we now discuss transformative action in your countries, the question is where to start. And um, also from how we started in our countries, I think one of the basic things you can do when you feel that there is something specific and something very empowering around this new concept of planetary health, a very good starting point is to, to found something, to found a group, to found a hub, to found a, a, a club, whatever it is, but to get together with other people to really make sure that you're not just on your own, but that you're found in something, for example, in the medical community or in the student community. It is also very important to see that in your countries, also in our countries, the youth is a, a part of the population who is understanding the fastest how urgent the things are. So you will be the driving force. We have seen that with Fridays for Future in our countries, but also around the globe, that you as students and young people, you have a chance to really drive something forward because a lot of the established people also have built their career into what is now kind of the driving forces. And we need to shift many of these things. So the invitation is that some of the youth players are taking the lead. So that would be a first step that I want to point to, the relevance of founding a group, of founding a club, of founding a network and there's a second thing which we are in the process of doing. Once you understand the relevance of the subject, it's important to get 
kind of a basic understanding, to go deeper in the understanding, to share the knowledge, to share good videos, good introductions, and then kind of define together in your groups, in your clubs, what are the one or two things you want to focus on first. And it's not important that you start with a perfect issue because you cannot start with all issues at the same time. It's important with one where you feel you have some capacity and there is some urgency. So as uh, um, Osano was saying before, uh, it, it is really important to, to, to kind of make your own priority list and then just get into action, learn, your, learn what is possible and move uh, involve more players and find ways of how to be active upon it. When we started in our work three years ago, we had about six months, one year where it was going very slow and we didn't know how to get to the medical associations and to the government and so on and so forth. Now we have achieved all of it because we learned how to go deep, how to involve more players, and then also how to share the narrative. It's very important. What stories are we telling? How are we communicating? How are we speaking to the newspapers? How are we speaking to radio stations? Because the subject that planetary health is about is very much what is bothering people already today in many, many places. And what it is providing is kind of a much broader and stronger um, kind of context that can help us to also get more into action. What I think is also very important for you to know is that uh, uh, the planetary health movement is growing fast also in the, in the countries of the global south, but also the understanding in governments and in foundations is growing. So I think there's a good chance that when you start things that you will get support so we invite you to really be courageous in founding and uh, we will in our next lecture invite some people to, to share kind of experiences and examples of, of transformational change that occurred in Eastern Africa. So that you see that sometimes you start with a few players, only two, three, four, and then you build something and still you can have a lot of effect. Uh, also, you are not so many people. That's perhaps the last thing to be very much aware of. All great changes start with a few players. And it's, uh, it's never predictable how a few players, uh, how they can, uh, can, are actually able to, to change the world. So uh, it is important to, to see that all these large changes came from a few players. And uh, the invitation is that you start something, that you found something. And next, uh, uh, in two weeks time, when we, when we have the next um, lecture series, we will bring a lot of examples and discuss what is the scientific part? What is the research part? But then also what are examples of transformative action? And also Laura at the end will invite for the workshops that uh, we will have in the next weeks now, which will focus on how to set something up and how to build something. So I think I want to stop with this and rather continue the conversation with my colleagues and you. And, uh, and also we are very happy to, to, to take some more of your questions. What would be interesting as well is how to engage people in times like this um, during a pandemic to perform those transformative actions that are necessary right now. Maybe we can get all the three perspectives on that question. Um, I mean, it really depends on where you are. You start with your neighbor, you start with your friend, you start with your class in the university, you start with your professor. Wherever you have a chance to kind of talk about what planetary health is about, you will see that uh, you will learn how to communicate it in two minutes, in five minutes, or in 10 minutes, whatever time you have got. Because the case that we have is very clear. People are aware how climate change and biodiversity loss is changing their lives. You have changing weather patterns, you have more malnutrition, you have more hunger. And it's just important to kind of spell out how these intricacies from the different dimensions of how we treat nature uh, play together and are uh, kind of threatening our health. And in your country, it's a threat and the dangers are already very evident. So I think it's important to just start and go and learn what is important when you start with this we will make mistakes, um, we will have to experiment. Um, so, so, but just get going and then we will learn from each other. When I look back three or four years ago, some of the presentations in, the, in hindsight didn't work so well, but that's where we learned how to do things. And now we have a very fast growth in our country. So just get going. 
you you yeah. talked a lot about the, the urgency before. so how can we underline this urgency even during times of a pandemic like we are facing now yeah uh, actually we can leverage technology we we can liberate technology and so, sometimes i say this we can also do blind letters eh, to 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 people that we want to collaborate with when we understand interests, especially those interests that converge with ours, then we need to go out and, and reach out to these people and, and explain to them what we are doing and, and, and not just wait for them to come to us. So I was thinking that we should leverage technology and we should also go through, may I call it the database of people who are doing things that are related to what we are doing and deliberately try to interest, it, in, interest them to, to work with us. That, that's what I would suggest now during this time of uh, the pandemic. Thank you very much. And I think um, with that, we are almost at the end of, uh, of our lecture today. Our next lecture is going to be in two weeks on trans transformative action and transformative past to planetary health. And we have heard quite a lot on this uh, today already, but we have three fantastic speakers joining us uh, in two weeks, exploring this issue a little bit more with us. And uh, as Martin had already said before, we already have um, another activity planned as well. And those are the upcoming workshops. So we're gonna have our first workshop on the 5th of December. Um, where we want to build up a planetary health action for uh, local communities together with you. And we there also have three um, amazing speakers and uh, planetary health advocates in their communities who are going to join us um, for this uh, workshop. And then we have a second workshop that is actually going to be a bit longer and it has two uh, two different paths in the diff uh, in the middle of December and it's going to be on those like transformative action that we're going to hear about next week and if you're interested in uh, participating in one of those workshops then we recommend to sign up on our on our website because you have to be registered to participate obviously and this is the end for uh, today I just saw that there is two more questions that have popped up so I just quickly going to read them out and we can maybe get a, a quick round of answers so the first one is um, in trying to address the solutions to challenges on the planetary health how can the strategy of change management be used to fast track the solutions and I think this is already a bit of foresight to uh, to next week's uh, lecture or Martin do you want to give us a a short answer to this. I mean, this is kind of the question of all questions and we will not answer it now, but it's just important to understand that one thing is to, to, to have the research and scientific perspective on something. Another thing is to change it kind of in a community because you have a scientific and technical dimension of, an, of, a, of a topic and then you have the human dimension. How do we communicate? How do we work together? How do we work when there is vested interest against the actions that we might have to kind of uh, start doing? And uh, uh, so there is no easy thing, easy answer to it. It's just important to understand that yes, we have the scientific side, we have the diagnostic side, and then we have to get into action and work with the people. And, uh, and that's one of the things we will kind of inquire more when we are, when we are uh, jointly working. One of the typical problems uh, is that, that oftentimes in, in the curricula and also in training, the, the, the uh, kind of transformative action side is not represented enough. So we are rather staying in doing more research than going into the uncertainty of moving into the open, dealing with people. Uh, kind of encountering all the difficult uh, power issues that are around kind of confronting hierarchy and stuff like this. So, but there is no kind of easy handbook that you can kind of read in 10 pages and then you know how to do it. I studied this in 30 years 
have worked on global scale, have worked with the most complex organizations of the world, and I continue to be a beginner in this field and invite you to be also a beginner in the double sense of we can begin something new, we can start, but also we can experiment, we can learn, we can innovate. Amazing. Thank you very much for this answer. And then we have uh, one last question uh, also to you, Martin, that is on uh, the color or like the possible collaboration between planetary health, one health and eco health. Um, so that we can look at where to collaborate instead of working in parallel. So I think there's a big overlap between these three concepts. Kind of from history, uh, EcoHealth was mo mostly coming from uh, uh, ecological researchers. One Health was mostly coming from veterinarians and planetary health is mostly coming from the human medical field. And I think all three are relevant and it's very important that we work together in the spirit of transdisciplinarity and collegiality. I also think that uh, given the, the, the vastness of the uh, human medical health kind of uh, sector, it is really, really important to get the, the human medical doctors uh, kind of fully on board and also um, to, to, to kind of make them to, to advocates for the, for, the, for the work. And I think that's one has been some of the difficulties with One Health and Echo Health that it hasn't yet gotten the traction we need also in the medical field for, for the human side. But uh, again, we work together with colleagues from all fields and uh, it, it, yeah, it's very important to do that in, in, uh, in a collegial and friendly, friendly manner with each other. Amazing, thank you. I think, uh, yeah, that is what all the um, speakers, also the speakers from last week uh, highlighted is that we really need those uh, collaborative approaches to, uh, yeah, to get where we want to go to, basically. And uh, with this, I think um, I would end the lecture right now. I've already given the, the outlook to next week or the week after. Um, we are very happy for everyone who has joined us today. I'm looking forward to welcoming you for the next lecture on planetary health as well. Thank you and goodbye for today.